Hey, thank you. It's nice to see so many of you, because it, it confirms something that I've always suspected, which is that what everybody wants just after lunch, while they're digesting, is quantum mechanics, right? Am I right? I, cool. Um, so I already got a lovely introduction, which is nice. I'm not going to talk about me. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about computers. And I think, you know, probably we're all computer professionals. We all have quite a lot of faith in what computers can do. And I think we all sort of suspect that, I mean, we've, we've used computers, so we know they don't do what we want. But we feel that that's a problem with the person on the chair, either us or the person who programmed it. And if we could just get rid of all of those annoying people, computers would be able to do anything. But it turns out that's actually totally wrong, which maybe should make us feel a bit better about the awful code that we all write. So I want to talk about a problem that seems really simple. And this is a classic computer problem called the traveling salesman problem. When it was first thought about, you know, it was a long time ago, and it was sort of this quaint little idea that you'd, uh, you'd have salespeople, and they'd go from door to door. We don't really have salespeople going from door to door anymore, but this problem is still really relevant, because now we have Amazon sending parcels from door to door, and we have airlines, and, and the, the amount of logistics that we have to do is huge. So the question is, if I've got maybe 10 destinations laid out on a map, how can I visit those destinations most efficiently? How can I use the smallest amount of fuel to get from, you know, should I go A to B or should I go A to C and then loop back to A? So the interesting thing about this problem is we actually have no idea what the answer is. We, we have a decent algorithm for it. We know, in theory, how to calculate it. But calculating the answer takes too long. So I want to I qualify that. Of course, there are some numbers of cities where you can totally calculate the algorithm. So making some assumptions, you know, if you had 10 cities, you could maybe get the answer in about 25 minutes. So that's OK. You, you can live with that if you're going to save a whole bunch of fuel, save the planet. But what if you have 16 cities? You can still get the answer, you can totally get the answer, but it takes 27 years. And so if you're a company who's making some logistic decisions, and you start this calculation, and then 27 years later you get the answer, you may as well not have bothered, because you've probably retired, depending how old you are, I'm sorry to say you might have even died. You certainly don't work at that company anymore. That company isn't using planes anymore. They're probably using flying saucers or something. So even though technically we can calculate the answer, in practical terms, we can't. And there's lots of examples of this kind of problem. So let's take something that we all know and love, which is caffeine. It's a pretty simple chemical structure. But what's interesting about it is that each of those little molecules, each of those electrons, protons, interacts with everything else. And what that means is that we get quite a lot of computational complexity. So if I wanted to do some calculations, I could represent it as a matrix. But the matrix I get isn't that, where I can decompose it nicely. It's that. So for two, a two by two matrix, well, those look actually pretty much the same. But you can see that this isn't going to scale in a good way. So by the time I go to three, instead of getting that neat little system, I get that system. And as I go up, it gets worse. And of course, we all know, particularly here, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is how do I decompose problems? How do I make problems manageable? How do I make a big team manageable? And the only way to do it is to decompose it into smaller chunks. But with caffeine, we can't actually decompose that problem into smaller chunks. And what that means is that we really can't do very good calculations on it. So if I wanted to model caffeine, do a simulation of caffeine, I need 10 to the 48 bits. And I think we sometimes, you know, we're so used to terabytes, petabytes, that we forget how big that is. It's really big. I had to make my font smaller in order to fit it on the screen. And let's imagine that we wanted to do a grand effort. And we said, you know what, I really, you know, 10 to the 48, I'm sure that's OK. Let's model caffeine. So if we make a sort of an optimistic assumption about how good we are at engineering, and we say, I'm going to use one bit to represent one atom, which seems like about as optimum as I could possibly get in a computer. In order to just do caffeine, 
I'd need to use about 1% to 10% of the Earth's mass just to represent caffeine. And this is really annoying and stupid, because if I was going to use 10% of the Earth's mass for something, I'd want it to be something more interesting than just caffeine. Because the interesting thing about caffeine as a problem, it's actually really small. It's pretty boring. I know how caffeine behaves because I just had coffee and I can see how it behaves. I don't need to use 10% of the Earth to figure that out. So the reason it's so hard is to do with exponentials. And we sort of... Oops, nope, that wasn't good. Okay, can you all still hear me? Okay. Sorry. How's that? Okay, yay. Yeah, see, if you thought quantum physics was hard when you could hear the speaker, wait till you see how hard it is when you can't hear the speaker. Right, so, so the exponentials are what really kills this. And I think, again, you know, we're all numerate people. We all think we kind of understand numbers. But I think even us get really surprised by how rapidly exponential numbers go out of control. So with the best supercomputer in the world, you know, the absolute best, best, best one, we can simulate a system that has maybe 40 or 50 electrons, which is really depressing, because that, as I said, you know, that's not a very interesting problem to use the best supercomputer in the world for. But of course, we don't give up. We don't just say, oh, well, we're never going to know what this is doing. We approximate, as we do for all hard problems. Sometimes the approximations are pretty good. So with the traveling salesman problem, for example, the approximation can get within about 1% of the optimum answer. And that's probably OK. But it turns out that sometimes the approximations are awful. So if you look at this, calcium monofluoride, incredibly simple molecule. It should be easy to, do, to you know, do some simulations for. And if we try and work out what the bond length is between, between the atoms, we know that when we measure it, it's about two angstroms. If we calculate it, we get four angstroms. So we're out by a factor of two. So at that point, that's really not OK. That's not an approximation that's a little bit wrong, but we'll live with it. That's just wrong. Similarly, so sodi two sodiums together, again, incredibly simple. If we measure it, we get three. If we calculate it, we get 2.3. So we're out by about 0.7, which is depressing. But when people were looking at these kinds of problems, they started to think about it, and they started to think, well, this system that I'm trying to simulate has a lot of computational complexity, and that's why I can't simulate it. But could I, instead of trying to simulate that complexity, could I actually use that computational complexity? And it turns out, the answer is yes. And that's where we get to quantum computation. So the, the, the important qualification here is yes for some categories of problems. And I'll, I'll come on to that. So the sort of the, the classic, not all problems are faster on a quantum computer. It's a, it's a narrow set, but it's an interesting set. And one of the classic quantum computational problems that you can do really fast is if I have a needle and I hide it in a haystack, can I find that needle? And normally, if I want to do that, I have to look through each bit. And th this problem was first phrased as the problem of looking through a phone book. So if I know someone's number and I want to find their name, can I do that efficiently? Um, and normally, you, you can't do it efficiently. You can maybe cheat, and you can make an index ahead of time or something, but fundamentally, you have to go through every single item in that phone book in order to find the right one. With a quantum computer, you can do it more efficiently. There's another problem in the same category, which is searching for a card. So if I have a queen, and then I have a whole bunch of other cards, and I've hidden the queen, and we want to figure out, well, which one of those cards is the queen? If you're going to do that, normally you have to look through each one. But you can do it more effectively with a quantum computer. So on a classical computer, the complexity is order of n. You may get lucky and find it before the end, but you may not. So I'm just going to do a quick little demo of this. 
And you can, you can do this as well. So if you Google for the quantum card test, you can find it. So. So if I Google for quantum card test, you can find it. So I've got the queen, and I'm going to sneakily hide it. And so I'm going to be sneaking, and I'm going to put it in the third position. And then I'm going to execute. So what it's done is it's flipped the cards, and now the computer's trying to find the queen. And so first of all, it does it on the quantum computer, and then it does it on the classical computer. And you can see the quantum computer took one attempt, and the classical computer took two attempts. So let's try it again. So I'm going to be sneaky, and I'm going to put it here. And I'm going to click Execute. And it runs. And it's running. And once again, so the classical one got lucky that time. It did it in one, and the quantum one did it in one. So let's try it again. Super, super sneaky. I'm going to put it all the way over here. I can never figure out what, um, what algorithm the classical one uses. So you can see this time, I really outsmarted it, and the classical computer took four attempts, and the quantum computer still took one attempt. And I should say as well that this is running on a real quantum computer. It's not a simulation. It's actually going off to New York and running on a quantum computer. And no matter where I put the card, the quantum computer can find it in one attempt, which is pretty cool. So. I go back to my slides. And so I, I should say as well that that was for four cards. With four cards, the quantum computer will always do it in one attempt. If I had like 100 cards, it wouldn't do it in one attempt. Um, so the complexity is really significantly reduced. It's order of the square root of n, but it's not magic. But it's still really cool. And we can use this for searching for a queen in a deck of cards, which is kind of useful to impress your friends, maybe, but not necessarily useful for other things. But we can use it for all sorts of problems. So any problem where we want to find the answer, and it's quick to verify that the correct answer is the correct answer, we can use this algorithm, which is called Grover's algorithm, to solve. So that's really, really cool. So how does it work? What, what's going on under the covers? So there's a few quantum principles that, that enable this. Um, and normally when I, when I talk about this, I, I have a physics background, so I really like physics. I think the physics is interesting. Um, but I've, I've, I've spoken to colleagues who have a computer science background, and they, it turns out not everybody likes physics. Um, and they, they, they don't really like the physics. And I, I was just told that um, a lot of you actually probably did physics in university. Um, so you may be sad that I've left out some of the physics. Um, but there's two principles that are important here. One is superposition. So that is a fancy word, which means being two opposite things at the same time. Um, and we all know that's impossible. Um, but at the quantum level, it's possible. And that's one of the interesting things about quantum, is everything that we know about how the world works doesn't really apply at the quantum level. And when we think about superposition, the, the best metaphor for we, that we have for it is Schrodinger's cat. Because Schrodinger, when they were talking about superposition, he said, well, this is really stupid, because look, this is impossible. You can't be two, things at, two opposite things at the same time. And so he said, well, if I had a cat, and a, there was a quantum interaction with the cat, and then it, it smashed a bottle of poison, and so that poison might kill the cat, and the cat would be both alive and dead, this is ridiculous, and everybody went, Hmm, yes, this is ridiculous, but at a small level, it's actually what happens. The other th thing, the other quantum phenomenon, is entanglement. And the bad news is that entanglement makes superposition seem really normal. <laughs> so with entanglement, what we have is we have a correlation between two things, and so far, so okay. Um, but when we think about how that correlation works, Almost the only way we can explain it is that information is traveling faster than light. 
And we all know that information can't travel faster than light. So then we just sort of get tied up in knots and we get really upset. So say I have two particles, and they're each in a superposition. What that means is, until I measure those particles, they're in two opposite states. As soon as I measure them, they become classical, which is why we have never observed anything being in two opposing states. So it will be either true or false, say. But there's a correlation between them. So if I measure one and it's true, then I measure the other one and it's false. So when I measure the first one, the answer I get seems to be random. Could be true, could be false, because it was both, and I get a random one of those two when I measure it. But what's weird is that when I measure the second one, I know exactly what the answer is going to be, because it's going to be whatever the first one was. So what if I do it the other way around, and I say, OK, well, so I know the bottom one is random, and I know the top one's not random, so I'm going to measure the top one first. And then the top one is random, and the bottom one is not random. Oh, dear. And so that what seems to be going on or, or the way that we would explain it to ourselves is that one particle knows what the other particle's doing, and it knows that we measured the other one. And you think, well, that makes no sense. How can one particle know I measured the other one? That's really upsetting. So, if we combine these two, and I'm going to read off the screen, because it's, you know, the sort of the words matter. So, a physical state that is in a definite state can still behave randomly. And two systems that are too far apart to influence each other can still behave in ways that, although they're individually random, they're still strongly correlated. And quantum computation is about working out how to use these two principles for a new model of computation. So, if at this stage you're thinking there was other talks that were not about quantum physics and I could have gone to those ones and this is really upsetting and confusing, um, you're in really good company because the physicists who discovered quantum computation were totally confused by it as well and they spent about 60 years arguing about it. So if you think you understand quantum physics, then you probably don't. So, and, and I, I love looking back at the quotes of, of as, as they were wrestling with these ideas, even the people who discovered them said, this makes no sense. So Schrodinger said, you must truly understand that the whole idea of quantum jumps necessarily leads to nonsense. So this is the nonsense computation talk. And, Einstein, he was really upset by the randomness and the idea that a particle could behave randomly. And he said, God does not play dice. And the other thing he said is that, because he was, he was upset by the randomness, but he was even more upset by the entanglement because it was Einstein who first said information can't travel faster than light. And then about 10 or 20 years later, loads of theories happened which seemed to involve information traveling faster than light. And he said, physics should represent a reality. One would hope that it would represent a reality. A reality in time and space, free from spooky actions at a distance. But entanglement is basically spooky action at a distance. So the good news is that if you're not into the physics, you can completely ignore it. You can abstract it away in the same way that a classical computer has a ton of physics involved in terms of the electricity that's flowing through the system and the transistors and you know, all of these functions. We don't need to know anything about that. We can just think at the computational level. And we can do the same thing for quantum computation, which brings us to the science of quantum information. And that has some really pretty simple principles. So the first thing is that if we think about a classical bit, and if I wanted to represent it as arrows, which would be kind of a weird thing to do because I don't need to, but if I represented it as arrows, I'd have an up arrow for zero and a down arrow for one. So far, so good. If I had a quantum bit, that simple up-down representation isn't enough anymore because this, this thing is a bit weirder than that. So instead, I represent it as a point on a sphere. And the arrow represents a probability. So if I measure it, I might get up or I might get down. If it's pointing mostly up, I'm probably going to get up. If it's post 
pointing mostly down, I'm probably going to get down. And quantum gates are just the process of moving that arrow. So if I wanted to do a bit flip, that's just the process of moving the arrow from pointing up to pointing down. And we're lazy, so quantum bit is much too much like hard work, so we say a qubit. And here what we're seeing is a superposition of 0 and 1. So far, so good. So what if I have more than one qubit? Now is when we get back to that, that spooky action at a distance, which is that my qubits can be correlated in a way that a classic, classical bit could never be. And we don't really have a good way of drawing this, but I sort of like to draw it just sort of as a smudge between the two, showing that whatever this one does, that one does as well. So how do you turn that into a computer? How do you turn these abstract things? <laughs> I should say as well that this is not the official IBM representation of what a quantum computer looks like. But basically, you take a very large fridge and you put the qubits in it. Um, and the interesting thing about this fridge is, is the temperature. So it's really, really very cold. So, you know, at the, you know, at the sort of the normal fridge part, four degrees, same as a normal fridge. Um, the, uh, the quantum part is about minus 270 degrees Celsius, which is cold. So it's it <laughs> stating the obvious. It's, um, it's colder than the space between the stars, which I find quite romantic. Um, so this is what it actually looks like if, if you build one of those things. And so you can see there's a whole bunch of equipment. And the interesting thing about all that equipment is that's all just the fridge. So the, the quantum computer is somewhere down there. There's a little chip. And all of the rest of it is just trying to get that thing to be minus 270 degrees, because it's not easy to get something to be minus 270 degrees. So that's what it looks like in the lab. Um, if you send a professional photographer to take a photograph of it, this is what you get. So it turns out it's actually really pretty. And again, if you actually want to see the chip, not the fridge, that's what it looks like. So that's, I think that's 12 qubits. So each of those sort of blobs is a qubit. So the interesting thing about this is that hopefully it's obvious because I've showed the pictures, that this, this is real. Um, this isn't something theoretical. This is something that actually, there's a bunch of these. They're in the labs. And the really interesting thing is that you can go play with them. So you can go through the magic of the cloud. You can access GPUs. You can access all this exotic hardware. And you can access quantum computers. And you can do it for free as well which I find really cool. So IBM was the first to make quantum computers available on the cloud. And you can go and you can sign up. You know, you, you have to get an ID, but that's pretty much it. And then you can play with these computers. So we've got a thing that we call the Q experience. And you can go and you can um, sign up, play with the quantum computers. There's sort of a, a graphical interface. And then there's um, which isn't really useful for complex programming, but it's kind of nice to play with. And we, the other thing that we've got is we've got something called QuizKit. And that is a programming language for programming quantum computers. It's a, an extension of Python. And it's all open source and, and all that goodness. So I'm going to do a demo. And the demo worked this morning which made me a bit uneasy, because it makes me feel I used up my one working demo for today. But if I go. Now, how many of you have used Jupyter Notebooks? About half. OK, cool. Um, so for those who haven't, the, the data science people have something that they call Jupyter Notebooks. And let me bring it up. So Jupyter Notebook, it's a mix of code, like this, and comments, and also the results. And they all get mashed in together, which is a nightmare for version control, but is quite useful for talking about what you're doing. And I'm going to do um, something which is available. So if you go, to, if you Google for um, QuizKit, then you can find a whole bunch of tutorials. And in there, there's 
find it, find it, find it. Somewhere in here. If you go to Hello World, you can find a couple of different ways of doing Hello World. And so if you want to follow along the source code, you can. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show Hello World. And the interesting thing about doing Hello World on a quantum computer is that you know, we've built these quantum computers that are real, but they're not very large. And so even things that are so trivial that you can't even you know, think about how trivial they are, like Hello World, the characters that you need to write Hello World is about, it's, it's over 100 bits that you need to write Hello World because for all the ASCII characters. So we can't actually write Hello World on a quantum computer. The best ones at the moment are around 20, 20 qubits. So, but we can, we can do, you know, this is 2019. Nobody actually types Hello World anymore. We all use emoticons. And you can do an emoticon, because that needs just 14 bits. So two ASCII characters. So we, there's, if I wanted to do a smiley, and I wanted to like go way, 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 way low level and encode it as bits, it would be that. And if I wanted to do some variations, there are those. So, oops. So with the Jupyter Notebook, I can run each frame. And the interesting thing about this is that it's Python and you think, oh, you know, Python, that's going to be really easy. And then if you look, you can see that actually, although I'm programming in Python, I'm programming at the level of registers. And most of us haven't programmed at the level of registers since maybe second year of, of computer science. Um, we, do, we do have something that we call QuizKit Aqua. And that's sort of going up the abstraction stack really quickly. So that's doing things like, let me take this and turn it into the domain of chemistry. Let me take this and turn it to the domain of, of finance. Um, and at that point, you don't think about the registers anymore. But if you're just using normal qu quantum computing, because there's only 14 of the things or 20 of the things, you, c you program the registers. So I've got a quantum register. I've got a classical register. And I'm going to define my smiling. And so you can see that qc.x is saying, in my quantum register, I want to do a bit flip on bit 0, 3, 5, 7, and 10, 11, 12. So let me run that. And so what I should see is if I run it and then I plot a histogram of what states I got out, I get exactly one state. And that's not very informative. So I'm going to actually visualize that state instead and I get 100% chance of getting that goggly-eyed smiling. So far, so boring. I could do this on a classical computer. So can I make it a bit quantum? I can. So if I didn't do the bit flip on the zeroth bit, and I ran it, and then I ran it, and, and you'll, you'll notice as well, I'm running on a simulator, and I'll explain why in a moment. So if I run it, I still get that. And then if I visualize it, I have turned that, flipping the zeroth bit, changed it from a happy face to a sad face. Well, can I make it quantum? Yes, I can. So instead of doing a bit flip, I do what's called a Hadamard gate. And that's a long word. But basically, that's saying create a superposition between 0 and 1 on the 0th bit. And so now you see why I was plotting a histogram, which is that I've got two states. Even though I did, only did one set of operations, I've got these two states. And if I now plot it, this, you can see half the time I've got a happy face, half the time I've got an unhappy face. So I was able to see on, in my computer the superposition. So what if I want to do something more complicated still? So let's put that back to being that. And I'm going to do, I, I want to do a, a, like a winky face. And so to do that, I have to change the seventh bit and the 
eighths bit. And so if I run that, and if I do my histogram, I'm back to only having one state. And if I visualize it, I've got my winky face. But now I want to do the quantum version. I want to do a superposition of winky and goggly. So I know the trick, right? Because I just did it on the zeroth bit. Instead of doing an X, which is a bit flip, I'm going to do a Hadamard, which is like a half a bit flip. So I run that, and I'm hoping that I'm going to get two states, one winky face and one goggly eyes. Ah, but I have four states. And if you sort of look at the zeros, you can see that I've got each combination of the two. And so if I visualize that, what I've got, my formatting's a bit off, but you can see I've got the winky face I wanted, and I've got the goggly face I wanted, but I've also got that like pirate face that I didn't want, and I've got a non-winky face that I didn't want. So really what I want is I want one one, and I want zero zero, but I don't want zero one, and I don't want one zero, because those are these ones. So if, I, if it was classical, at that point I'd be stuck. I'd just say, oh well, or I'd, you know, I'd do some post-processing. But I can do it with a quantum computer because I can create a correlation and I can say, if this, the, the seventh qubit, which could be zero or could be one, if it's zero, then the eighth qubit is zero, and if it's one, then the eighth qubit is one. So instead of having my little Hadamard gates, I, s I still have the Hadamard gate on the eighth qubit, and I have this, which is that CX, and so it's like a controlled knot. So it's like an if statement, sort of. So I run that, and then I run it on my simulator, and you can see I got rid of half my states, because I've got a correlation between those two. And so now if I visualize it, I'm back down to, to two states. I've got the winky and the goggly. So all of this was run on the simulator. So let's run it on the real system instead. So it takes a little while to initialize. And I'm, I'm hoping that we're early enough in the day that we'll be able to run this before the United States wake up and start doing loads of quantum computation experiments. But it all depends. So we'll, just, we'll see what the Q length is like. Oh, cool. The Q length is only one. So that's good. Um, so now we can sort of watch. So the sort of the there's a that was running on a 14 qubit computer. There's also a 20 qubit computer that you can get access to if if you pay. Um, and then there's bigger computers that are that are being researched. Um, but I still find it kind of amazing that even though 14 qubits is so small, you can just use it and, and send experiments to it. And they have, um, they have a map that shows where experiments are being done. And the nice thing is that you can sort of see like little, little you know, bubbles as experiments happen. And they get experiments being done even in Antarctica, because there's someone in the research station down in Antarctica who I guess thought, Antarctica, a bit boring down here, really. What I need for fun to just to liven things up, because you know the, the Arctic isn't you know enough, is I need to run ex quantum experiments. So she's down there sending um, sending experiments. Cool. So the job has successfully run. And so now, if I plot the smiley from the real run rather than the simulation. You can see it's not quite the same, <laughs> so which shows it's real. So I've got the expected goggly eyes, and I've got the expected winky eyes. Um, I also have that, which is sort of surprising, and I also have that, which is sort of surprising. Um, and so if I look at it, you can see it, it's not quite as clean as the results were on the simulation, but that's what shows that it's real. Um, and there, there's sort of interesting things ab about this. So you, you can see that you know, you're, you're probably not going to um, 
be, be taking that answer and, and you know, perhaps betting on the stock market using those results yet, because there still is quite a lot of noise in the, in the system. And which computer you get sort of affects how much noise you see as well. So if I was to rerun it, I'd get a different set of results. But I'll just go back to the slides. Cool. So I've got the demo, the video, because never trust the internet. But this time we did actually manage to make it work. Cool. And here's um, a screenshot of a, a different result from an earlier run. And again, you can see it's similar. It's noisy, but you know, the, the broadly, broadly the same. So just going back to, to what was going on and why that was hopefully maybe sort of interesting. Um, it has to do again with that correlation that I wanted 0, 0, and 1, 1, but I didn't want 0, 1, and 1, 0. And if I express that as matrices, you know, that for, um, for Hello World, for the emoticon, I'd have it as sort of a, a 7 by 7 matrix. And it's those two states that you can't really see in the middle there that were the ones I sort of cared about. So if I just focus on just the bits that I care about, it's it's those ones. And what I was able, so if I, classically, I couldn't find a way of writing that matrix that didn't have all four of those. But what I was able to do quantumly is cross out two of those states and have that so that I had two, but not the other two. And so the only way you can write that is as the whole big matrix. You can't take that matrix and decompose it into smaller matrices. So, which is where the computational complexity comes from. So, of course, this wouldn't be interesting if all we could do was emoticons and write down big matrices. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting applications. Not all pro as I said before, not all problems um, have super simple, amazing quantum versions of them. But there's a whole, if you're into complexity classes, which Anybody into complexity classes? That's about four more hands than, I've, than I usually see. So if you're into complexity classes, then there's a class called BQP, um, which is problems that are easy quantum mechanically but hard in other places. And there's a whole bunch of things that you can do in BQP. So the thing that sort of started it all off was that simulating chemical molecules. So if we had qubits, we could, well, if we had 160 qubits, we could model caffeine. The next, the obvious extension from, from chemistry simulation is materials design. So that's starting to get quite commercially relevant. Stepping on even further, drug design has, you know, we could maybe get new drugs, potentially life-saving drugs. Um, there's a lot of synergies between artificial intelligence and quantum computation um, in, in a number of different ways. But I, I sort of like to think of it that way. If you, do, if you do dig deeply into artificial intelligence, at some point it just becomes eigenvalue, eigenvalue, eigenvalue. And a lot of the quantum computation is eigenvalue, 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 and it's all those matrix mathematics. Uh, there's finance applications as well. So it can't predict the stock market. It can't actually know what's going to happen in the future. But if you have a heuristic for optimizing a formula, if you have a heuristic for something like arbitrage, there's quantum algorithms for, for doing that kind of optimization. I talked already about the logistics, the sending the plane from here to here to here. How do I find the optimum way of doing that? So where next? Um, I showed, I showed the quantum card test. It was real. It was solving a sort of useful problem, if a party trick counts as a useful problem. Um, but it has to be said that it was small. So it was running four cards. And of course, it would have been so much cooler if it was running like 52 cards. And then you'd go, wow, I can really see that the quantum computer was faster. But the, the pace at which quantum computers are speeding up now or, or expanding it is huge. So when I, when I did my PhD, it was pretty much all theoretical. And we sort of used to have these conversations in the corridor of, you know, will there ever be a real quantum computer? Well, uh, I don't know, because it's, it's really hard to build a quantum computer. And then all of a sudden, I looked, and quantum computers had been built. And if you look at them, you know, a bit like 
they can only do the quantum card test for four cards. If you physically look at them, they don't look, or certainly a couple of years ago, they didn't look that impressive. So this is, in 2016, what a quantum computer looks like. And if you compare it to something like an iPhone, it's not very impressive. It's just got wires sprouting everywhere. But if you think back to the history of computing, and if you look at the old pictures of the ENIAC, they're actually strikingly similar. They're, they're both sort of there in a rack with wires sprouting everywhere. And so we're going through a process of industrialization. So earlier this year, we announced what we're calling the System One. And when I read the, the press release for it, it said it's the world's first commercial quantum computer. And I thought, I don't really understand that because IBM is a commercial company. Surely everything we do is commercial. Um, but what it means is that it's the first computer that you can take and you can run outside of a lab. And it doesn't need all of the people sort of minding it and taking care of the refrigerator, and it doesn't have wires sprouting everywhere. So we've run that at trade shows and that kind of thing. So that, the, the system one is incredibly pretty. It's still not exactly what I'd call useful. So there's, you could, still can't t solve a problem on it that you couldn't solve classically. But we're so close now. So we, ha we have this idea of, of phases in the quantum computation journey. So for the longest time, we've just been doing the foundations. So research scientists cared a lot about quantum computation. Nobody else did. Where we are now is this phase that we call quantum, quantum ready. And so that's, you know, we can see, we want, we can see it's coming, so we want to make sure we're ready. And where we're all trying to get to is quantum advantage. And so quantum advantage is when there are problems that you can solve on that computer that you could not solve classically. So then the next question is, well, when, when do we get there? And the answer to that is, well, or rather, you know, the sort of the follow-on question is, how many qubits do we need to see quantum advantage? And it's a, it's a surprisingly no, low number. Um, so you can't simulate a quantum system above about 50 bits, 50 qubits. So that's sort of a, a, a rough point about where you need to be. Um, because our computers are quite noisy, that makes a difference as well. So we like to make a distinction between approximate quantum computation and fault-tolerant quantum computation. Classical computers at the hardware level, there's errors everywhere. You know, a lot of what it's doing is wrong. But there's error correction protocols at every stage of the stack to make sure that the errors, you know, get majority voted out. We know how to do that for a quantum computer as well, but you need a lot of qubits. So if, for example, I wanted to take a qubit and say, well, even if errors, if, even if I have errors, I'll get the right answer, I'd need nine physical qubits in order to make one reliable logical qubit. And so if I have a 14 qubit system, like the one I showed you, that means I could have one logical qubit which is really not going to be useful. I couldn't even do an emoticon on that. And for some of the, the algorithm, the applications of quantum computation that get everybody really excited, like it's going to break cryptography, for that, it's got to be exact. It's got to be perfect. If I, if I get a key and it's out by one bit, well, I don't have the key. You know, it's only useful if it's perfect. But there's a whole other category of problems where being close is good enough. And, and being close is better than where we are now. So if some of those chemical approximations, some of those optimizations, if I can get something that's within like 1% of the right answer, I'm doing so much better than I was classically. So those are the problems that we're looking at now. So the quantum chemistry, the optimization, the, the machine learning. And for those, you need maybe, maybe 100 qubits, maybe 1,000 qubits. So we reckon we're going to be there within five years. For things like breaking cryptography, for you know, things like these big linear algebra problems, 
you're going to need to do the error correction. So you're going to need 10 to the 8 qubits. And for that, it's probably at least 10 to 15 years out. And there's a huge engineering leap as well between doing these smaller computers and doing the bigger ones. So there is still this open question of maybe we do 100 qubits and then we run out of engineering steam and we can't go and make that leap. So we'll have to see. Time will tell. But, but I think it is, it is exciting and it, it is interesting to see where it's going. So, you know, right now, a quantum computer, it, it mostly still lives in the lab and, it, you know, it's not pretty. But I think probably in not too long, we are going to have the quantum data centers that are commercial and everywhere and solving problems that we actually can't solve now. So with that, I'll leave it. Um, if you want to find out more, um, do Google IBM Q experience. You can go have a play. Um, you can look at IBM Q or quizkit.org, um, lots of other resources. We don't have time for questions, um, but I'll be around for the rest of the day. Um, so if you do have questions, I'm happy to answer those. And thank you very much.